So as a brief overview of what I'm going to speak about, I'm going to give you just a little bit of background on cancer research in general. I'm going to talk a little bit about clinical trial methodology because I think if you're a, a discerning uh, uh, patient today or advocate and you're, you're reading around, uh, it would be helpful to know something about phase one, phase two, and phase three trials and what an extended access program or EAP is. I'm going to touch on a few key therapeutic questions that may or may not be underway in, uh, in kidney cancer trials today or different, different methodologies of research. And, um, and, then, and then summarize the current clinical trials that are uh, open in Canada today. So, you know, cancer research is huge. Uh, many different kinds of cancer research is going on around the world, and clinical trials uh, in patients or drug development is only one aspect of, uh, of that, but a very important one. So much research is actually happening in the labs in basic science uh, on scientists and translational scientists um, uh, long before ideas come to uh, uh, forward for potential therapies. And the real role of the basic science is really to expand our knowledge of how biology of a cancer, particular cancer, differs from normal biology. And then some of that then lead, goes on to generate ideas that then can be brought forward as potential uh, uh, ideas or targets to be developed for treatments. There's a whole lot of other information out there that comes from other types of studies. For example, uh, we learn a lot from just population-based studies. For example, if you can review a large number of patients, which we call a cohort, uh, with a certain disease, say kidney cancer, uh, and look at what various characteristics or habits uh, um, they have, and you, you can learn something about the determinants of and, and predispositions towards developing cancer, and that is extremely important work, but you usually do that by looking back at, at data um, before you start going forward with hypothesis. For, so for example, this uh, slide is just sh uh, showing kind of what we know from various different types of, of, um, of uh, studies what are the potential risk factors uh, for kidney cancer. Uh, so much of our information has actually come from understanding some of the genetic risks uh, that, that run in kidney cancer families that then told us something about what happens in the spontaneous cases of kidney cancer and that led to a lot of the drugs that you've heard talked about today that are tra targeting um, angiogenesis or blood, blood vessel formation downstream of this uh, abnormality called VHL. So all this different research has come together. And then when you look at uh, cancer drug development, it really is a process. And I, I drew this to give you a sort of a sense of timelines and also the, the, um, the amount of hypotheses and ideas that go into generating what can move forward towards a potential therapy. So if you look at my big gray arrow, arrow there, which is the preclinical or the laboratory stuff, the, the size of that and the fact that it goes off the page is meant to represent just a huge body of basic science and, and other uh, exploratory work trying to look for a better understanding of the biology. And then from that, relatively very few things look promising or are capable of moving forward into clinical studies, and by clinical we mean patient studies. So the preclinical includes animal work and all kinds of things. In the clinical studies, we're talking about human beings, and usually in this situation, patients who have cancer. So the first, what, what basically happens is there's a phase one study, and if that is uh, um, conclusive or able, uh, an agent then moves forward to phase two, and then eventually to phase three. Then I'll explain what these are in a minute, but you can see the lines get less um, thick because there's less and less and less ideas that actually go forward. So by the time you get to phase three, this, this idea has probably been around and being generated for quite some time, and, it, and it's, it's the result of what might be 10, 15, 20 years of work. 
So very briefly, so a phase one clinical trial is a very early drug study in patients. And the goal of that study is to determine what dose of this drug is the best one to take forward to a phase two study. That's really what it is. So it, it really is kind of the, the guinea pig uh, type of study in, um, in uh, patients. However, with all the exciting new agents that are coming along so rapidly in recent years, it may also be your, a patient's chance of getting access to a drug five, ten years ahead of what uh, might turn out to be uh, a real winner. So just imagine, you know, if you were the kidney cancer patient that got Sutent back in phase one uh, nine years ago, something like that. These are conducted very carefully to maximize safety, in, and so they're conducted really in very specialized cancer centers who know what they're doing with these kinds of studies. It will often enroll many different types of cancers because the goal of that study is dose and not, and not efficacy. Uh, it, they're small studies, maybe 12 to 24 patients. And it's also the place where if you're going to put two known drugs together as a combination, you have to go back to phase one to see what doses of each drug can be combined together safely. So for example, that drug Avastinib bevacizumab plus the new Affinitor would, if you want to put those together, you've got to go back to phase one and see if it's, it's safe and what dose of each one. So the next one is, is, is if it comes, if a drug comes through phase one and it seems to, they, they seem to have found a safe, uh, manageable dose in, in, in patients, it goes to phase two. So phase two is all about trying to see if this dose of drug that, that is recommended from the phase one uh, has any hint of activity at all in a group of very similar patients. So usually phase two is everybody has kidney cancer or everybody has breast cancer and uh, everybody gets the drug at the same dose. There may be some dose reductions for toxicity in that, but the goal really is, is can we see, does this, is there some proof in the, uh, in the hypothesis that, that led us to this point, all that research before? These are also generally small studies, about 30 patients in general, and um, I think the harsh reality of drug development, especially in oncology, is most of these are negative. Most of these really promising ideas fall at phase two because we don't see anything. We don't see the, the promise. So when something does get past phase two with some hint of activity or promise in patients, um, we start to plan how are we going to really see if this is adding something to patient care and that takes us to the big phase three trial. So you can see how those arrows get smaller with time. So now the goal of a phase three trial is, is really to try to find a new standard of care. How are we going to advance the field? How are we going to make it better for patients than it was before this study? So the, the whole idea is, is this, it, this looks promising enough that it might actually change the way we care for patients. So what, what phase three trials almost always do is they're randomized trials, which means a computer flips the coin on what arm you go on, and it compares this new experimental arm, which has come through phase two, and it, it has to be compared to some control arm, which is usually the recognized standard treatment. So for example, the standard arm could be an older, more established treatment, and let's see if this one's better, or in some cases, it could just be no treatment or a placebo plus supportive care if that is indeed the standard of care in that disease or clinical setting. These are very large trials. They range somewhere between 500 and 1,500 patients. They're often done internationally or North America-wide. They're very uh, exciting. Um, they take a long time to uh, complete. and. Um, the interesting point is, is because these are scientific studies, it may take 800 or 1,000 patients to, ask the, to answer the primary endpoint of the study. The primary endpoint is usually, does this drug uh, allow patients to live longer with this treatment than the previous treatment before? 
So there's a million questions we as doctors and you as patients and caregivers would like to know about these drugs, but a clinical trial doesn't have the statistical power to answer all those questions. It, it has the power to answer uh, one good one properly. Um, uh, and of course, these are geared towards hopefully leading to a drug's registration or licensing in a country that then makes it available as a standard of care. So the perfect example of a, of a good phase three trial was um, sudnitinib versus interferon. One is the old standard of care in first-line metastatic kidney cancer. Looked much, much better, went forward, became licensed, became the new standard of care. So if you look back at my drug development cartoon, you can see now you have a little bit better feel for what's been going along as a, as a, as a promising drug has moved from laboratory through phase one, phase two, and then finally uh, to hopefully a positive phase three trial. It's at that point it goes forward for registration. And then my blue arrow here is this sort of, I guess it's a little bit of a limbo period in which the drug, we know the drug works, we know we want to give it to our patients, but we're dealing with the bureaucracy of funding issues and other things, and, and this is where these extended access programs are so helpful, and many patients probably got drug through extended access programs or EAPs, and the, you know, the EAP is a good thing. It, it allows patients to get access to a proven drug earlier than normal channels, it gives physicians who may not have been involved in the clinical trials experience with the drug that they may not have had before. It gives, builds goodwill for the drug company, uh, gets more experience out there, and hopefully it leads to uh, that being taken over by a licensed drug. I also put in this brown arrow, which is pointing back, and this is where you get that sort of feedback of a bench to bedside to bench again. When questions come up along the way, how, how does the drug work? Where does resistance develop? Some of those questions may indeed have to go back to the basic science uh, lab again to answer based on some of the things we learned in real patients. So here is a very busy slide, but basically this is a, a treatment um, or a timeline showing how all the drugs we've, you've heard about a little bit so far uh, came along and got licensed. And uh, the bottom is looking at U.S. timelines, which are always a bit faster than Canada, and uh, the Canadian timelines on the front, on the top. And this is, as Dr. McKenzie pointed out, this is th these have been very, very unusual times. You know, it, it, I know uh, we never have enough therapies, but this is really rapid, rapid change for uh, drug availability for a previous cancer that really didn't have many options. And other cancers look at this with... Uh, or sites with envy. So this has been rapid change. So not surprising, it's a little bit confusing and all of us don't always know what is the best, always the best approach and, and, um, uh, and sequencing of drugs to take. So I put this on just mostly for myself because I um, interchangeably use uh, the generic name and the proprietor name and the different names. So in case any of you are wondering what they all are, this is listed out. Serafinib was the first on the block. It's Nexavar, you know, Sunitinib and Sutin. New kid is Pisopinib, Votriant. Bevacizumab is that one in the U.S. That's the IV drug, Avastin. And then the new mTOR class of drugs, the first one was Tem Temsorolimus or Torosol. And then the very newest one, uh, I still call it RAD, RAD001, Everolimus or Affinitor. So some of the key questions that one could say we need to get at in kidney cancer, one, how do we prevent it? Two, how could we make the surgery or other local therapies even better for patients long term? Uh, three, how do we cure more patients after surgery than surgery alone? And then there's all these drug treatment questions. How do we control the advanced disease and, and make patient outcomes even better than they are now? We need more options. We need to optimize the sequencing of the drugs, sequencing of drug with surgery, with radiation, with breaks. All these are important questions. We need to explore our combinations better than sequencing, or is it better to just do one drug at a time? And of course, the ultimate goal of all, I think, cancer research, it's kind of the holy grail, is we need to sort of personalize 
treatments so that we really get the best outcome with every patient we uh, treat so that uh, we know uh, patient A is going to do better on this drug and patient B is going to do better on this drug. We're not there yet, but that's our goal. And of course, as we've heard, we need to, we have to learn better on how to manage the side effects of these important drugs. So now I'm at the stage where I'm going to talk about the, the open Canadian uh, clinical trials, and some of these are international trials. Um, so I'm going to start with early stage disease. So you've already heard uh, reference to the, the trials, which we call adjuvant or adjunctive to surgery. So these are patients who have had, um, you see I've broken this down here, the study, what population we're studying, what the real question of that trial is, what are the arms, and then a few comments. So in the first one, the ASSURE trial, or NCIC-REC2, these are local, so confined to the kidney, cancers that have been resected with clear margins, but based on those issues that Dr. Jewett raised about the stage, uh, these are fairly higher risk for recurrence at some point down the, the road, micrometastatic disease growing back. And so our question is, can we cure more if we put a drug in after uh, surgery? And this is unknown, completely unknown in kidney cancer. We never really had drugs before that we were uh, excited about. So um, some of you are, are maybe participating in this trial. There's three arms, sudanitinib versus serafinib versus placebo for one year. And it's probably, honestly, one of the most important studies ever done in kidney cancer because it has the potential, if it turns out to be positive, that we will improve those survival curves and cure more people. And it's almost completed accrual, but it will take some time for all the data points to come together. It, it's still going to be a couple of years before we know the answer to that. Meanwhile, uh, uh, the newest drug on the block, which is very quite similar to sunitinib, pisopinib, uh, there's a trial uh, about to get started by GSK, which is essentially the same. It's looking at, at, at resected kidney cancer of relative higher risk and it's going to look at pisopinib versus placebo, and it's going to start uh, accruing, I think, this fall. And uh, it's really, I see this as, as probably a, a chance to confirm some, some of the data that will come out of the first adjuvant trial. And um, it may also give some data on whether this drug is effective and maybe easier for patients to take uh, than uh, the ones in the first study. So now we move to advanced kidney cancer, which is metastatic kidney cancer, and we don't, uh, we don't always think this way as clinicians, but in our studies we have to sort of break it down into patient populations, so we're looking at these are patients getting their first line um, uh, drug, their first drug they, they're getting for metastatic disease. So the first one is Glaxo's uh, study in metastatic disease where they're comparing this new drug, pisopinib, versus sunitinib. So pisopinib is very much like sutent. It's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and it looks very active. It looks quite similar, but they've never been compared head-to-head. -head. And the goal of this trial is to show, I think, from pisopinib's point of view, that this drug is just as effective as sutent, but perhaps better tolerated. You know, we may be surprised with the outcomes, but uh, that's a reasonable question. And this is almost done in terms of accruing patients. The next uh, trial is, I call it the Wyeth Combination Trial, which is looking at a combination of two drugs uh, and to see which, which one is better. So um, the standard arm in that is the bevacizumab plus interferon, which is that, com which is that two IV and, and needle therapy that's really used more in the United States, but not, not used here, and it's being compared to bevacizumab plus the mTOR inhibitor. And this wasn't really embraced in Canada because it's not really our standard of care arm, but there are some certainly some Canadian sites that have participated in this, and it's wrapping up. The next one is Record 3. So record 3 is also uh, metastatic renal cell carcinoma. And it's looking more at the sequencing question about moving one drug to another. And um, so basically, it's going to look at 
uh, patients who have not yet been treated with drug in the advanced setting uh, will be randomized between Sutent until they progress and then Affinitor or the opposite, Affinitor first until they progress and then Sutent. So it gives them a chance to get the two drugs and we're going to try to find out if maybe uh, we have better options, whether, whether patients might do better on, on one sequence or the other. Um, uh, so that's just about to open in a lot of centers across Canada. And then finally, we have a trial that's coming forward for non-clear cell uh, kidney cancer called Aspen. And there's really been a tiny bit of what we call prospective or going forward data looking at non-clear cell histology. Um, and this is one of the first trials. So basically, they're trying to sort out which of all these drugs we have might be the best. And they've chosen two reasonable drugs to try, the Sutent drug versus the Affinitor drug. And there's certainly some d data from different sources that both drugs might be effective. And so this might give us an answer uh, as to which one should be the first one we try. And then, of course, we have many patients who do very well on, on first-line therapy and then, you know, progress with their tumors growing. These drugs, unfortunately, lose effectiveness at some point, and we need to sort out what are the best drugs to use next. And there's probably about eight or ten of these kinds of trials going on in the world, but I'm, I'm focusing here on the ones that are in Canada. So the first, the first one is the Wyeth trial for patients who have progressed on Sutent. And then we're asking the question, well, which class of drugs is best to use second? Should we use the mTOR inhibitor Torosol, or should we go to the old, old similar but well-tolerated drug uh, serafinib? So this is a very good question, and uh, this is near completion of accrual, and we'll probably hear results of this within the next year. The other trial uh, is the ACCESS trial, and this is a um, little bit more liberal in, in its inclusion criteria. Patients could have had a whole lot of different previous therapies as long as they haven't had serafinib or this newer drug, ex excitinib. And excitinib is, once again, another one of these TKIs like Sutent or serafinib, but it's very, very potent. It hits the these targets that we're talking about with, with an affinity much greater. So it begs the question, maybe this more potent drug might rescue tumor responses in someone who has already progressed on, on uh, Sutent. So basically patients are randomized between the potent drug versus a reasonable alternative choice, which would be uh, serafinib. And this, this is near completion. It was mostly done in the U.S. and there were a few Canadian uh, sites involved. Um, I haven't talked about any toxicity studies because there aren't really many uh, planned and I put this up to try to remind people. So in case you can't read this, this is a, a gentleman in a, what looks like a hospital bed speaking to his doctor or nurse and he basically says, I stopped taking the medicine because I prefer the original disease to the side effects. So from what you've heard today, that would, be, that would not be good news because these drugs are great and they are helping patients a lot. So we want patients to stay on drugs and we have to find better ways to deal with their toxicity. So it's a key question and we need to we do, do research in that. And then my last slide here is this one, which makes my daughter laugh. Um, so when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And this is to remind us of our goal and why we keep doing research, despite how much hard work it is. Um, we want to try to personalize uh, treatments to the individual cancer and in patients so that we have many tools, not just hammers, and everybody looks like somebody different. So I will conclude now with putting up this website. This is a great website, www.canadiancancertrials.ca. Deb told me about it. Um, it's, it's really put together by the uh, Canadian Coalition of Cancer, a lot of, lot of reliable agencies, and it essentially, um, it's very easy to use. You can go in, you find, you, you put in kidney, it's interesting, kidney comes up as kidney and ureter, and then you open that up and you can pick your province, and it's all Canada, and it will open a page of trials that are open, 
And it's interesting. They give them slightly different names. They give them kind of general lay, lay term names, which, which is good. And then you can click on that, and it gives you a little bit of background on it. And then you can also move along and find uh, participation. And, and you click on that, it'll tell you what, what hospitals are participating in this study. And I've checked a few, and it looks pretty up to date. And, um, and then you can actually even highlight that hospital, and it'll give you a contact number. So I think, you know, and it, it also says on the top of the page, if you're very interested in this, this study, print the page out, take it to your doctor, and then they can refer you on. So I think, you know, there's, for many reasons, research is good. Uh, one, the, one important reason is it gets drugs to patients earlier, so participating in a trial is always, always a good idea. But you also have to remember that we would not be where we are today if we hadn't had such tremendous participation of, of, of patients in all these trials that we've done recently, which has rapidly advanced the field. Thank you very much. Let me go with the first one that's about clinical trials. Um, it says, uh, we've heard today that, the gov that our government um, wants clinical proof before they will consider funding new treatments. Could you comment on why they do not accept results from others like, say, the USA? So let me just, let me just be very clear. Um, so the USA is not different than us. The, the USA large, especially recently, does require the kind of rigorous clinical trial data that um, we do in Health Canada. Uh, every country's um, regulatory um, safety and drug agencies want to take responsibility for their um, for their own review and not just take the and not just take the advice of the US because I can think of examples where perhaps the US made a mistake so Health Canada does their own review and a very thorough and careful review I mean on one hand uh, it does take a little longer in Canada to get a drug but uh, there are examples where Canada's been a little bit safer uh, and prevented bad drugs from getting out there too fast as well. So, uh, so the, the 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 evidence is the same. the The process may be a little bit longer in Canada, but I think the real the real crux of this matter is the fact that we have a publicly funded healthcare system, which which is uh, has limited resources, and every time a new expensive drug comes along, um, every province the province has to make a decision about whether it can fund it or not and that's where we differ from the US where the US they don't really care how, how a drug gets funded because perhaps up until now uh, those have just been up to the patient's private means to uh, to fund so there's there's really two very different systems and I don't know how to fix the funding issues in Canada uh, many smart people don't know how to fix it either but I think it's fair to say that there needs to be more uh, dialogue and discussion about what we as a public want to, want paid for and what we don't want paid for and it may be fair to say that that um, that there is a, a general lack of true understanding of what it means to have a drug that allows you to live longer but doesn't cure you and all this probably needs to be challenged and re-examined but that's um, we're um, we're not that different from from other countries so that's that. There's a whole lot of questions here that seem to relate to genetic risks and the um, and and treatments for children uh, with genetic predispositions for kidney cancer. So I'm I'm by no means an expert in that in in this area. I think if you have a family history or there's kidney cancer um, uh, in your in a child in your family, you really need to be at a, 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 a hospital for sick children uh, center of excellence, and you need to have a genetic counselor involved, and you need to be followed by those uh, types of patients, one of the types of, of experts and an entire team. Uh, there's a question about why, why the drug like Sutent isn't yet licensed. Um, you can imagine that you saw my slide on how slow the process is for drug development. So one one doesn't take children and experiment them on them before there is data in the adults so it's an, it's natural that 
the pediatric drug development process it lags a little bit behind uh, the adult world. But having said that, it's been my experience that the pediatric oncologists seem to be able to get access to these drugs through compassionate programs maybe a little bit earlier than the, uh, in, than the um, um, uh, adults do. So um, I do know that there are children that have, or teenagers that have kidney cancers that are similar to the adult cancers that are being treated on these TKIs, but I would really hope it would be in a, a huge center of excellence. Um, there's a question about the use of um, IL-2 in an inhalation form, so in a breathing form for lung mats, and is it commonly used in Canada as an adjunct to treatments? No, it is not commonly used. I don't think it's commonly used anywhere. Um, it, I would think that, was, that would be a very experimental procedure. Um, what lifestyle choices, diet, extra, would, would you recommend to prevent recurrence of kidney cancer? And is lifestyle being included in following and surveillance? So the, the short answer to that is healthy living is always important. Um, you can imagine when you've had your kidney out and you've got a remaining kidney, you want to do everything you can to keep that kidney uh, safe. So blood pressure control, exercise, relative diet, uh, controlling your diabetes, all these things are phenomenally important. Anything that can get you to, in your best kind of condition is going to lead you to do much better when you have to be treated if you do have a recurrence. But there is really not a lot of data, in fact there's probably data that doesn't really support that you can actually change the natural history of, a, of an already established cancer uh, with diet and exercise in any really meaningful way other than that it, that it, um, that it enables the patient to be in better health and better condition for, for therapies. So um, you should look after your remaining kidney if you have relatively uh, relative kidney insufficiency after you have your kidney out, you, 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 you need your blood pressure ma managed, you might need to see a kidney specialist and have all that kind of care optimized.